Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood upright and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to those who would listen, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, but not on the Sabbath day. Our Lord Jesus answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each and every one of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all of his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. Christ. Please be seated. Can anybody relate to this story this morning? I know I can. I know Vera can. I look out upon everyone here and I know you all can as well because we all suffer. We all suffer from pain. We all suffer from bondage. Now most people think that's kind of strange, but when you think about it, let's face it. In our day-to-day -day lives, there is anguish. Whether it is physical, mental, or spiritual, there is anguish. There is pain. There is suffering. How is it that we get through those days? Well, we can follow this woman's example. Now, we hear that for 18 years, she has been afflicted with something that will not allow her to stand upright. 18 years. Now, let's also remember that in the time of Jesus, if you were afflicted with any type of ailment like that, it is believed it was because either you were a sinner or your parents were a sinner. That's the only reason you're in the condition you're in. And for 18 years, man, that must have been some sinning you were doing. And because of that, you would have been shunned by the rest of society. You would not be able to participate in most of the things that the other folks were doing. That even for this woman to go to the well to draw water, she probably would have went early in the morning or late at night when no one else was around. We also know in the time of Jesus that the synagogues had been thriving for some time because it was a place other than the temple that they had come so that they might hear the word of God, they might read from the old scriptures, from Genesis and Exodus and the first five books of what we call the Bible. And they offer up prayers. The only catch was you had to be a male. You see, synagogues were started when ten men would get together and they would come to worship God, they would come to hear the word of God, and then those men were supposed to take that back to their families and teach their families. So, to have a woman in the synagogue, that would have been a no-no. And yet, there she was. You know what I find interesting about this whole scenario? Even though that was against the law, if you will, this woman comes into the temple, or excuse me, into the synagogue, and nobody notices but Jesus. How could you not notice that? Let's face it, she wasn't dressed like the rest of the guys. She didn't look like the rest of the guys. It should have been quite obvious because they would have been the first people to point it out because they like to cast stones a lot, and yet, She's unobserved. She's hiding, maybe, in the shadows. We don't know. We also don't know why she's there, but I like to think it's because she heard about Jesus. Maybe out while he was teaching somewhere in the wilderness, maybe she heard some of his words. 
Maybe she heard how he healed so many people. That the lame were able to walk, the blind could see, the deaf could hear, the lepers were cleansed and restored. Maybe she had heard that, and maybe she had even heard about the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, and she just touched the hem of his garment and she was made whole again. Maybe, just maybe, she thought that if I was to see him, if I could hear him speak, that maybe somehow I might be restored again. We don't know. But all we know is that she crossed the line and she went to be in the presence of Jesus. In those 18 years, I've got to figure a couple things. I've got to think, just like us, when we are afflicted, that just like us, the first thing we might do is say, God, why? Why me? Why now? I mean, that's a natural thing, is it not? God, why would you let this happen? God, why is it that I am faithful in what I do, and yet I have this affliction? I have this going on in my life, whether it is a bodily affliction or something else going on. Why, God? And a lot of times, we are met with silence. Now, sometimes at that point, we change our prayers. Instead of saying, why, God, we kind of get over ourselves and say, well, God, I ask for healing. Whether it's for myself or someone else, God, please show your grace and mercy. And a lot of times, too, we are met with silence. I've got to believe that this woman experienced life the same way as I do and many others do. That in those 18 years, she probably pled with God, please, God, do something. And if she's just like the rest of us, after a while of this silence, she probably got more insistent and even began to tell God how it was he was going to heal her, when it was he was going to heal her, and where it was she was going to heal, get healed. And yet God was probably still silent as well. And you know, a lot of people, when they... They experience that silence of God. Sometimes they turn away from God. Sometimes they figure God is not care. Sometimes they figure that God is too busy with other things. And yet we have to remember this. God is God. And we are not. We do not know His ways. We do not know why things happen. We don't know. But what we have to do is trust. What I've come to learn over the years, especially through everything we've been through, it's a passage from 2 Corinthians that sticks out. Paul wrote this saying, But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Paul was not cured. <clears throat> but Paul understood that in his weakness, the power of God shone through. And that is what has helped me get through so many days and so many nights. Knowing that it's not all about me, but it is all about the grace of God. And that God can use somebody as broken down as I am to be able to share his love and his grace in this world. And if you think about it, most of the time when you break a bone, the doctor will tell you when it heals, that spot that is broken will become the strongest part of the bone. But first it's got to be broken, and that's not always a fun thing, is it? Think about it this way, that for us to eat bread, the ground must first be broken. We have to till up that ground. We cannot leave it just as it is. And after we till up that ground, after we break the ground, we must put in the seed, and the seed that is buried in the ground must break through 
that shell that is encapsulated in. And then it must break through the ground itself until it comes out into the sunshine. And once it breaks through and grows nice and tall, then somebody comes along and breaks it. It separates the chaff from the wheat. And then after it has separated the wheat and the chaff, well then you take that wheat, and what do you do with it? You grind it between two heavy stones, and you make flour. It is broken, and broken some more, and broken again, and broken some more, and then finally that flour is taken, put into a bowl with some yeast and some other ingredients, and then it's got the snot meat out of it, and then you throw it into a hot oven. So you have more beatings, and you have more heat, and then finally you have bread, and this bread can be used to feed those who are hungry, those who have nothing. More importantly, that same bread with the Word of God can be given to His children. And in that bread we receive the body and the blood of Christ. It is here that we hear, this is my body given for you. And we are made whole, we are restored. But first, it must be broken before it can be of any use. We forget that sometimes. I forget that a lot of times. And yet, God is able to use what is broken. He doesn't break us down, but rather, in our brokenness, He is able to raise us up and to use us so that His love and grace might shine through in this world. You know, a lot of times we think that when we pray that, that God doesn't hear us. We think that that silence is God just ignoring us, but... This week on Facebook, somebody posted something very profound. It was, it was done like a cartoon, and it showed, it showed a, a young lady praying. And it showed her on her knees, and of course, it almost looked like she had a kneeler, and she was putting her hands together praying. And the caption said, this is what people think praying is all about. It was a good picture. But then the other, the other, illustration said, this is what prayer really is. Bill, put your hands together for me, for me. Bill is praying here. He's in that position that we are all used to seeing, folding our hands. It would be almost like that woman that was praying. But here's the difference. In the second illustration, the woman was there, but Jesus was there as well. And his hands were covering her hands, and his eyes looked upon her with love and compassion. No magical words. Nothing changed except the presence of God. You see, in 2 Corinthians, we hear, my grace is sufficient. The translation of that word sufficient can also mean to stand with. That my grace stands with you. That I stand with you. That no, you might not feel that restoration. You might not be changed physically. But to know that I am with you, that changes everything. That God's light shines in the darkness of our lives in many different ways if we are just open to it. And that if we trust in Him, He shall see us through. It just might not be the way that we want. Don't mistake silence or emptiness. Just know that God is there. And in that silence, open your heart and mind. Be silent yourself. And that is when you experience that presence. That's what gets me through those many, many nights when I cannot sleep. Instead of filling my head with mindless things like TV or video games or anything else, I just start that conversation with God, knowing that He's there. And then I just shut up. <coughs> and I listen. And I experience. And I know that I'm not alone. And that's what this woman found out. She was not alone. That God was with her. And God indeed came that particular day. And on that day, God then spoke and said, You are made whole. Notice the change of character, too, because in the beginning, Jesus said, woman, come here. But afterwards, when the hypocrites 
spoke about her, Jesus said, this is a daughter of Abraham. Not only did he hear her, heal her physically, but he restored her in the community itself. That he made her whole in ways in which she could not ever hope for. And yet God did that. Also notice, she didn't have to say a thing, did she? That God knew the time, knew the place, and he knew it was right. And without her asking, without her badgering, without her pleading, God said, no. And she was made whole. We can learn a lot from this woman, this daughter of Abraham, this child of God. That yes, we may suffer, and yes, we may get impatient, but do not ever think that you are alone. For the grace of God is all that we need. And in that grace, we will surely witness and feel the strength that can only come from God himself. And that's what shall see you through today, tomorrow, and all of the days until we come into God's kingdom. Let us rejoice.